good uh, evening from uh, Greece. Good, uh, good afternoon and good morning in uh, the United States. Uh, I'm Dimitris Sapokis, the chief ed editor of international news from ERT, the Greek national television. Uh, today we have an important discussion uh, here uh, on uh, the uh, upcoming U.S. presidential elections next Tuesday. One of the most crucial elections uh, in the last few decades, as far as I'm concerned, my view is that they are very crucial and very strange elections because uh, they happen in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, uh, Actually, I co-host that, uh, I co-moderate this uh, discussion with my friend Andy Zemenidis. And I have the pleasure to introduce one of the one of our speakers in the discussion, Mr. Uh, Reins uh, Pribus, a former chairman of the Republican National Committee and uh, former chief of staff of President Trump. Eddie? And, and thank you, Dimitri, and thank you to the Delphi Forum. Uh, and it is a key election, and maybe the Delphic Oracle will, will give us some insight uh, after this conversation. I, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome our second uh, discussant, a former Illinois State Treasurer, Alexi Yanulias. Uh, and even though that's how we're advertising him, his claim to fame in Greece is being a, a starting guard for Panyonios. Uh, and teammate for uh, <laughs> Health Minister uh, Vasilias. Uh, Alexi Reins, uh, welcome, and, and hopefully we, we get more clarity than the Delphic uh, ambiguity. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Uh, <laughs> Reins, I, I want to start with you, and also since we're, we're talking about uh, Greek street cred, uh, we should remind everybody that your middle name is Hercules, <laughs> and, uh, and that you are an archon of the, of the Greek Orthodox Church, so uh, thanks, uh, thanks for all that. Uh, but despite some very strong polling uh, for Joe Biden that's been consistent, uh, President Trump and his campaign seem quite confident uh, and high on his chances for re-election. Uh, what do they see that we might not be seeing in the polls and in all the other modeling? Well, first of all, thank you, Andy, for for that. And I want to thank the Delphi Forum, everyone watching, Alexi. You know, I grew up in uh, not far from where Alexi was uh, campaigning, and, and and he was a star and still is. And I think you're going to see that Republicans and Democrats can actually get along here. And seeing that we're both Greek, we like each other to start. So it's, I don't think this is going to, there's not going to be a lot of blood on the floor. I hate to disappoint everybody. <laughs> but let me just tell you one, of the, you, one of the odd things about what's happened here in the United States is that we have got such people diametrically opposed politically. 90% of people voting for Biden think that Biden is going to win. 90% of the people voting for Trump are adamant that Trump is going to win. And nothing you can say to either one of those groups is going to convince them that the other party uh, is going to win. So, you know, energy is high. People are hot. And it is going to be an extremely close race. Let me explain why this race is so hard to measure. In rural america in 2016 donald trump won the election by almost 18 to 20 points so if you're in the middle of wisconsin outside of our biggest city of milwaukee uh donald trump won by about 20 points in wisconsin today donald trump is ahead by almost 30 points in rural wisconsin there is a little bit of bleeding going on in trump world around the suburbs by about five percent but there's a lot of people in the suburbs. So what's really difficult for pollsters to try to grapple with is the fact that you have a 30% surge in rural America, a slight decline in suburban America, and you're trying to piece that together, calculate how many people are going to vote, which is the number one most difficult question to answer, which is how many people are going to vote. But you have to put all of that together and somehow, you have to tell the American people, this is what we think is going to happen in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Florida, North Carolina. 
and it is very, very difficult to do. So to your question, Andy, and I know we have a lot of them, and, and I invite you to dig into whatever you want to dig into. The reason why I think that things look better for Trump uh, than what, number one, what you watch on the news is that there is a tremendous election day operation for the president, both through the Republican Party and the president, and the enthusiasm for the president is off the charts. Early and absentee ballot voting has been off the charts as well, and it favors quite substantially the Democrats. And the Democrats have done a good job of getting their vote out early, but I don't believe, and I can go state by state with you if you want, but I don't believe that they have met the level of support that they need to meet to overcome what's going to happen on election day, which is an overwhelming Trump response. I'll give you one example, and we can do this in any state you want. In Florida, for example, um, I believe that the Democrats, and they've broken all records, the both parties on early vote, absentee ballot voting, um, the Democrats have about a 500,000 person advantage on absentee ballot mail in Florida. The Republicans, though, have a 300,000 vote advantage in early vote. And what early vote is, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, absentee ballot voting is when you get a ballot in the mail and you turn it in in the mail. Early vote is when you show up at a, at a building somewhere, a precinct, and you wait in line and you cast your ballot. That's early vote. The Republicans have a 300,000 person advantage on early vote. So overall, we're minus about 180 to 200,000 ballots. Election day is another pool of people that come out and vote. In that pool of people, the Republicans in Florida tend to, and a lot of it depends on turnout, we're going to have anywhere from a 350 to 500,000 person advantage on election day. I would be very surprised if Trump doesn't win Florida. That's also the state you all should be watching because it's going to be one of the first states to come in. And it also counts all the absentee ballot and early votes at the same time that it counts uh, the election day vote. So that total is going to be very important. I think the president has a lot of energy on the ground. So I'm gonna follow up to that. We see the national polling, uh, the uh, almost the majority, the absolute majority of national polling shows uh, Mr. Biden, the former vice president, with a huge lead. At the same time, uh, myself watching uh, presidential elections for the last 25 years, uh, I'm seeing, for example, that Rasmussen reports the national polling is uh, so close, almost tied, and day by day we have the president one or two points in front, then we have the vice president one or two points in front. I don't know that today's uh, Rasmussen reports uh, polling that uh, came out yet. Uh, but uh, at the same time we see the president having something that I didn't see in, in the past in presidential election. This uh, huge rallies with uh, tens of thousands of people in the middle of COVID uh, crisis, which is very dangerous and many people fear that. Uh, but uh, I saw people coming out for the president and uh, uh, the president speaks every day for, the last, uh, for many weeks now about the silent majority. Uh, do you think we have a silent majority that they fear to speak that they vote for the president on all these other polls. Uh, talk a little bit about that situation and specifically <clears throat> about these huge rallies. For me, it's a very big surprise to see the Americans uh, act like that. I never saw that in past elections. <laughs> right. Um, well, you know, it's a, it, it, it's, it's a wild thing. I mean, you've got a president that can fill arenas and there's no band, there's no Rolling Stones, there's no Michael Jackson, there's nothing. It's, it's some talking. And you have tens of thousands of people, sometimes 30,000 people in an airport hangar with 10,000 people waiting outside. And they're all at like 95% level for the president. I mean, these are people who will walk over glass to see the president, vote for the president, 
and it's going to make a big difference. And by the way, these are all people that are putting up yard signs. They're volunteering at, you know, what we call victory centers. Those are like where the volunteers, uh, Alexi knows all about this as well. In, in that kind of energy matters. Now, there's a lot of energy of people who can't stand the president, too. And that's where Joe Biden gets his horsepower from. It's not so much, hey, I love Joe Biden. It's I don't like Trump or I love Trump. And that's really what this election in many ways comes down to. But to your question about the polling, I had I had talked to a campaign individual um, that discussed the there was a there's a, an individual that took and bought the polling data from a lot of these polls that are being conducted and what they found was after talking to about 75,000 people who refused to answer the um, questions of a polling company they found that about 65 percent of the people that refused to answer these questions supported the president, President Trump. And it, what they found was that older Americans didn't want to answer the question of polling companies because they were afraid that maybe their house would get vandalized or they'd be, hey, you don't, you know, you get the idea. So that's why I think the polling is is off. But also, look, and the reason I'm sure Alexi is not going to spike the football yet, it's a uh, or a slam dunk to basketball yet, put it that way, since he's a basketball player, is that we all lived through 2016. We've seen this play before. We've watched this movie before. And the movie before was when I was RNC chair, I had leadership in my own party tell me that we needed to stop funding Donald Trump because there's no way he can win. And can't you see that the fundamentals aren't there. Can't you see that this guy can't win? He's going to lose and it's going to lose bad and it's going to be horrible and we're going to lose the Senate and everything's going to go away. And lo and behold, the president won. And what it also showed, Demetrius, is that when they said Iowa, we'd lose by one point, we won Iowa by 10. They said we're going to lose Wisconsin by six, we won Wisconsin. They said they were going to lose Ohio by one, we won Ohio by eight. We're going to lose Pennsylvania by six, we won Pennsylvania. We were going to lose Michigan by five. We won Michigan. So, you know, I would say just take everything you hear with a little bit of a grain of salt. The one thing I had in 2016, though, here's the deal. These parties are sophisticated. They know where the votes are at. The Democrats know. The Republicans know. One of the reasons I kept funding the president was in 2016 was that we knew in Florida, that we were 120,000 votes ahead of where Mitt Romney was in 2012. We knew it because we could see both by party uh, affiliation, but data and having data on every voter in Florida, meaning we know what beer they drink, we know what car they drive, we know how many kids they have, we know whether their mortgage is right side up or upside down. Believe me, we know everything about them. So when I see that these 10,000 people voted in Orlando, Florida. We're not just guessing how they voted. We, we number one, we can see what party they registered for, but we all, if they didn't, if, we, if they don't look like they're party affiliated, we look at their data and we can make an almost certain assertion as to how they voted. So the parties aren't looking at the polling. The parties are looking at the data sets and it is extremely sophisticated and people know what they're doing and 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 there's a lot of money that's been spent on trying to figure this out uh alexi my first question to you uh the chairman mentioned uh, 2016. i want to get back to 2016 and say to you that in 2016 we uh, talked a lot about the blue wall for hillary clinton and uh, just now the chairman explained, and all, all of us know right now what happened in 2016. No one expected uh, Donald Trump to win the presidency, and it happened. Uh, do you think that we are, uh, it is possible to have a deja vu situation in uh, these elections? And uh, th why do you think it's different this time, and why? Uh, why? why do you think that? Well, first of all, Dimitri, Andy, uh, thank you for taking time to moderate. Uh, Ryan, thank you uh, for for being here. 
you know, when, when Trump got elected, I was devastated. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be horrible. It turned out to be uh, to, for me to be accurate. But I will say this. I kept on telling him, well, he's got a Greek chief of staff. Well, he's got a Greek chief of staff. So all my agony and pain and suffering and sadness uh, was tempered a bit by knowing that uh, a Greek American reached the pinnacle of American politics, which to me is the most important office in the world. And that's not the president of the United States, but the chief of staff to the president of the United States. So, Ryan, it's, it's nice to see you again. Uh, thanks for your service to our country. Uh, and thanks for being a great friend. Um, and, you know, in hearing uh, Ryan's uh, uh, answer, you can tell why he's so good at this, why he's so smart and he's so good at politics. He's got numbers, he's got data sets, and he's got percentages, and he brings up all the positives. Um, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to this. With four or five days out, who would you rather be politically and probably morally and as a human being? Who would you rather be, Joe Biden or Donald Trump? And I think that if you ask them honestly, all the national polls, electoral college polls, state by state, the trend lines, the early voting, I think if Ryan were to be honest, he'd say, I'd rather be Joe Biden right now than Donald Trump, which is not to say that we're taking anything for granted. Um, but to, to begin with, the Biden campaign has not taken anything for granted. And just to take the classification blue wall, Dimitri, uh, that you mentioned, those states were almost neglected in 2016, but not so this year. They have actually been prioritized. As far as the polling, it is true that there was a uh, Clinton lead in key states at this point four years ago as well. Uh, but here's a difference on that front. Polling in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania were actually getting tighter uh, in 2016 as Election Day drew near. And now it is holding steady or even increasing. And I look at yesterday's Washington Post ABC poll, which showed uh, Vice President Biden with a 17 point lead uh, in Wisconsin. Even if it's that's off by 50 percent, that puts Wisconsin in, in the vice president's column. The polling also seems to be tracking President Trump's approval rating, which has consistently stayed in the range of high 30s to mid 40s at best. Another important point, in 2016, Donald Trump was an insurgent. He was the exciting uh, guy who said it was on his mind. He wasn't running on the record, but he was running against the record of his opponents in both the primary and the general, which as Ryan will tell you, is a, a much better place to be in. But now he's the incumbent. And this election is very much, very much a referendum on him and his performance as president. And finally, um, in large part because of COVID, uh, we've witnessed unbelievable early voting numbers. So we have a pretty good idea that Democratic turnout is going to be better and more intense than it was four years ago. And key constituencies that, that, that failed to turn out in 2016 or voted for Jill Stein uh, certainly affected the outcomes in Wisconsin Michigan uh, and Pennsylvania. So here we are with four or five days out. Again, I'd much rather be Joe Biden um, than Donald Trump, but a lot could happen. And that's why I think it, where I agree with Ryan's getting out the vote, seeing who shows up uh, with these last few remain days is going to be enormously, enormously important. I think with the blue wall theme, um, whatever we call these, these states, is that, is that, the Biden path to victory, or is there a different a different path? And since Reince told us that he's going to be looking at Florida first on election night, uh, what state uh, will you be most focused on on uh, election night? Well, clearly uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan are priorities uh, for the Biden campaign. And the other point I didn't mention uh, unfortunately, money plays a huge role in politics. I wish we can get rid of that. That's a conversation for another time. That being said, the money that's poured into uh, Vice President Biden's campaign uh, has allowed a st steady stream of TV ads in some of these battleground states and these uh, blue wave states. It's helped with GOTV efforts. It's helped with voter identification. Um, so th the fundraising gap has been enormously helpful to this campaign. Wisconsin and Michigan, there are multiple paths to victory. Uh, Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, Iowa, Ohio uh, are all in play based on the internal polling that the Biden campaign is looking at. So yes, there are multiple paths to a Biden win, uh, but it, it looks to me like the best bet would be Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. 
And Andy, to answer your second question, uh, because it's on the East Coast, I'll probably be looking first in North Carolina because it also features uh, a Senate race that could very well swing control of the United States Senate. Uh, a win in Florida for Biden would make it a very early evening. If Trump wins Florida, Pennsylvania obviously becomes critical for Biden. And Arizona, another state uh, where a key Senate seat is up, uh, is probably more important than it has ever been in a presidential election. Also, I know it's a long shot, but keep an eye on Iowa and Texas. I always said I would never be a Democrat who truly believes that we could win Texas, but you never know. Uh, Mr. Sherman, uh, same question to you, almost the same question. Uh, looking at what happened in uh, 2016, you were there present, you were in a critical position to you know, have the clear picture of the country. You explained to us in your previous answer what happened. Uh, this time, uh, which are the critical uh, states for uh, the president, the states to watch that night? And uh, since uh, Alexi mentioned uh, the Senate, there is a lot of discussion that uh, there is a possibility that the Democrats this time around will have a tremble, as we say in football, not the American football, the football that you call soccer in the US, <laughs> uh, meaning that they have the presidency, the Senate and the House. Uh, do you think that's a possibility and which states are crucial for this tremble, the presidency, the Senate and the House? Well, certainly it's possible. Um, anything's possible, I think. I, I think we can agree that we, we really, this is just a really tough one to predict. And I, I agree with Alexi's, um, his um, view of the states that matter. What it does show you all, which is hard, I think, for folks that don't follow closely American politics. And I know there's a lot of people on this call from different places around the world. We don't have a national election for president in the United States. We have an, we do, but it's really an election that is spent in about eight states in America. So you can have, President Trump could lose the popular vote by millions and millions of votes and still win the presidency. And I agree with Alexi. I think that for me, aside from the fact that Florida is so important, and I said, of course, we're all gonna change Florida, the two states I would really look at are North Carolina and Pennsylvania. Um, I think that Ohio, Iowa are in good shape. I feel good about Florida. I don't think we're going to lose uh, Georgia or Texas. There's just too many Republicans there. It's sort of the opposite problem we have uh, in some of these other battleground states. We're just too many Democrats and we can't turn it, even if we think we might. There's just, there's just too many in the pool of people that will always vote. They're, they're the, what we call the high propensity voters. So we know who they are. They never miss a vote. We've got their name on a list. And there are just too many Republicans on that list. Now, I do think the, the alarm bells are sounding for the Republican Party in Texas, in Georgia, and we're going to have to get to work there. So North Carolina right now is on a razor's edge. We're down about 300 ballot, 300,000 ballots on absentee ballot and early vote. And we've probably got about 300 in the pool, a, 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 an advantage of 300,000 in the pool over the Democrats in North Carolina. The Democrats have a fairly popular governor in Governor Cooper in North Carolina. And that, that there's a, that's a double-edged sword because it means that that helps the Democrats, but it also means that pollsters get confused by that because you have a lot of people that might vote or support the Democrat governor, but then vote for Donald Trump. And it makes the polling confusing. Pennsylvania is important because it's got 20 electoral votes. And if something goes wrong for the Republicans in Arizona, uh, you can make up a big part of it by winning Pennsylvania. The twist in Pennsylvania today is that they've got over a million and a half people that have voted early. It's never been a state that voted early. It's always been a state that you could spend money in right until the end and make an impact. And, and the, uh, many, many Democrats are voting early. So it's harder to read. It's hard to know what's happening in Pennsylvania. And one other little problem for the Democrats is 
of the Democrats that have ballots through the mail in Pennsylvania haven't turned them in. So in order for them to vote on election day, they actually have to go and either cast what's called a provisional ballot or they have to bring their ballot in and spoil it and then vote. They've added an extra step to the process in Pennsylvania. So those two states and Florida is where my attention is going to be uh, right as polls close. Even though we're state by state voting and that's what we're looking at, one thing that has affected every state and makes this kind of a, a national election is COVID. It's impossible to to think of this election uh, without that backdrop. And the president right now is trailing badly among people who list COVID as their, their top issue. If he loses uh, on Tuesday, what what do you think about the U.S.'s COVID response will have hurt him the most? Um, well, I think what hurts the most is just being president during a pandemic. I mean, we can debate all day long um, the response, what Joe Biden had said at the same time in March and April, what his advisor, Zeke Emanuel, said, what Lisa Monaco said in March and April. They said the president was overreacting in closing down travel. They said that, uh, you know, you still go about your business. Joe Biden was doing ra- doing events in March and April himself, and, and they were all accusing the president of overreacting. Well, now they look back and say, well, you know, he said to Bob Woodward that, um, you know, this is a really deadly virus in February, but then Fauci himself said, don't wear a mask in February and go about your business, he said on February 28th, to go about your business, to go about to movie theaters, don't stop what you're doing, you can still go to malls, So, you know, there's a lot of confusing back and forth on this thing. The number one problem politically, and I, is when you're the incumbent and something bad's going on and you're the incumbent, look, it doesn't help. It makes it harder. I think the president would have sailed to reelection if it wasn't for the pandemic. Sure, there's going to be people that don't like Trump. They don't like how he does something. You know, there's always going to be the Trump debate. But look, you saw the economy today, and we'll get into that later. You know, 65% of the economy has come back in the report today. Uh, set over 7% GDP growth in the third quarter. I mean, it's, it's tremendously positive. But having COVID and Corona while you're seeking re-election, Obviously, it's not helpful. No one can spin it any other way. Um, The bigger question, though, is when voters go to vote, how many people in the middle, how many people that don't know whether they want Trump or Biden, that very small piece in the middle, how many of those people are going to vote and saying, if it wasn't for President Trump, we wouldn't have these problems with COVID. No one can really answer that. You can cast aspersions all day long about it, but look, it's growing all over the world. I think we got the chairman frozen. Probably the sermon to hear the refresh button. Well, we try. While we try to reconnect with him, uh, you want to move on to a, a COVID question for Alexei? Yes, uh, Alexei. Let me ask you this: uh, We listen to the chairman, and we see every day that, uh, uh, in my opinion, and uh, some other people say that that uh, Vice President Biden is focusing almost entirely his campaign on uh, the COVID response by the president. Uh, but we don't listen uh, from the vice president and the Democrats something like uh, uh, about what is happening all Man. over the world. It doesn't. It doesn't happen only in the U.S. We see, for example, that Europe right now is in a, a hell situation. The uh, cases go up uh, extremely high every day, every other day, and. Uh, as, uh, uh, furthermore, the vice president doesn't speak a lot about China. 
I don't want to go into the other situation and other questions about China, but it's specifically on COVID, we don't see the vice president uh, to speak openly about the responsibility of China of what to happen with COVID. The president is focusing a lot of that. Uh, he sounds optimistic. Uh, he chose, in my opinion, as I see it, a strategy to be an optimistic leader and say that we will overcome, we are uh, turning the corner on that. Uh, tell us why the Democrats don't speak about all these other things around the COVID crisis and focusing on what uh, President Trump did or did not uh, about the crisis. Well, we're focusing on it because we're focusing on death, economic destruction, hospitals that are that are full, and the enormous, enormous challenges and day-to-day -day struggles that Americans across the country are having. But before I answer the COVID question, and this is, you know, to, to Ryan's point about popular versus electoral, he's 100% right that uh, it's not a national election, it's state by state. I think the system is flawed. I think the electoral college system is, is dangerously flawed. And, you know, obviously no one knows for sure what's going to happen on Tuesday, but I would bet Ryan said uh, lunch at the broad stop that Biden wins by over 5 million uh, votes. That being said, um, to answer your question on COVID, let's be clear. President Trump is not being blamed for the existence of the pandemic, uh, but he is being blamed and rightfully so for the U.S. government's disastrously inept response to it. Well over 200,000 Americans are dead. We have 4% of the world's population, yet we are responsible for a quarter of global deaths due to COVID. We are supposed to be the most sophisticated, the most technologically advanced, the most powerful, richest country in the world. And we have not come close to getting a handle on this. And our worst days are ahead. And that's not my opinion. It sadly is based on scientists, economists, which is why we're seeing this third wave. He has turned mask wearing into a partisan issue, which I never in a million years would have imagined it to be. And he's and he's the leader of that movement to make it a partisan issue, even though his own CDC director has called it our best defense against this virus. And scientists who are completely apolitical have claimed that well over 150,000 lives could have eventually been saved by the strict usage of masks alone. 150,000 lives. These are people's mothers, fathers, grandparents, just by wearing a mask. And instead of having someone uh, go out there and say, wear a mask every day, it's we've turned the corner, we'll be back by Easter, don't worry, we have a vaccine coming. Every statement he makes proves to be dangerously and disastrously inaccurate. And at a time when COVID hospitalizations are on the rise across the country, the president dismisses the rise of COVID cases as being a byproduct of more testing. His rallies feature little, if any, social distancing. He and his staff have not set good examples when it comes to CDC guidelines. So the, the real problem is that the president keeps feeding into the false net narrative that we're, quote, turning the corner, which is appealing to people who are fatigued, who have been hurt economically, and who are scared, like many of us. But leadership is not telling people what they want to hear but what they need to hear, especially as we're trying to literally save lives. We need resolve to beat COVID more than just happy talk. We need an example for the entire nation since national standards might not be on the table and the president is simply not setting such a national uh, example. Now is the time for leadership and we're not seeing any of it and it's causing people to die. And when you talk about uh, elections or re-elections as, as Ryan has been in politics even longer than I have, it's about an agenda and a vision for the future. What is your agenda for the future? What will you accomplish? What are your priorities? And he time and again has come up with zero, zero priorities. He said in the debate that, well, he wants everyone, everything to be great and the economy to be great. That's your priority. Where are the specifics? What is the policy? And now he's complaining that the media is focused on COVID. It's focused on it in large part because people are dying, because the economy is stagnant. And even, you know, Ryan mentioned the, the GDP numbers today. And I know Republicans are going to try and pull the wool over everyone's head and say it's great news, but it's not great news. The game that we saw this morning um, means that the economy has recovered 60% of the COVID cases. The economy is smaller than it was a year ago. 
and the the recovery slowing down as we're heading uh, into winter time. That's that's a fact, and I can tell you that uh, being a small business owner myself seeing the impact that it's had on me, my neighbors, other small businesses, uh, landlords, local banks, it is an enormous challenge and things are getting worse. And so I am nervous about the future and that's why we need new leadership. We need someone who's gonna take the helm, get a handle on COVID, move this economy and move this country forward. Um, Alexi, and we're getting a lot of questions about the consequences or the, the what Greece and Cyprus and U.S. foreign policy uh, will face as a result of this election. So we may skip ahead there, but I think Ryan made a, a fair point in that, hey, the biggest problem is your president during a pandemic. Uh, winter is coming. We got a third wave. It's not going to be done by the time inauguration comes along. So let's flip, let's flip the script. Let's say let's say Joe Biden is president on inauguration. Why will the, why will, why will the COVID strategy out of Washington be better or will it, or is this a case of just being, it's better, easier to be in opposition than it is in government? I, I disagree with that. I think fundamentally leadership, symbolism, making the right decision, listening to scientists, having a task force, um, that is making the right decisions, focusing on contact tracing and testing. So yes, I unequivocally feel that Joe Biden will set a better example. I think that uh, mask, the mask will become a symbol of protecting ourselves and our fellow Americans rather than just an object of, we'll definitely see more national guidance that attempts at coordination rather than uh, every state for itself, every city for itself, every block for itself approach we've witnessed this year. And we'll witness the type of leadership that uh, under Joe Biden, that Prime Minister Mitsotakis and Minister Kikilias showed in Greece, putting public health experts and epidemiologists front and center to educate and reassure the public. And most importantly, a uh, President Biden will be able to deliver his party when it comes to producing an impactful relief and stimulus package, something which to this day blows me away that Congress uh, is unwilling to do. Senator McConnell is unwilling to help people on Main Street who are getting decimated every single day. Um, and he will uh, he will deliver for his, with, with his party. And this package will not only help American individuals and small businesses that are hurting, but will provide resources for reopening our schools and our businesses safely. It will include resources for rapid testing, for contact tracing, which again is still inexplicably not widespread. So uh, some, uh, some not day differences. Since we are short on time, unfortunately, as uh, Andy mentions, uh, let's uh, uh, turn uh, very quickly on uh, things that are very close to the heart of the Greek audience, the people that are listening to this discussion and participate from Greece, and specifically the Eastern Mediterranean, the Asian, the greek Turkish relations. Uh, and I want to ask my first question to the chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, people in Greece are uh, disappointed uh, with the president. Uh, that's the reality, uh, because we see uh, Turkey, and you handle these issues as a chief of staff, and uh, you are also a Greek-American, uh, these issues are very close to your heart. Uh, the uh, attitude of Turkey is uh, uh, inexcusable in the Aegean, and uh, uh, its attitude inside NATO is inexcusable, uh, we had the move uh, by uh, Congress to suspend and the administration to suspend the participation of uh, Turkey to the F-35 uh, fighter, the program. Uh, Turkey proceed with a, a buy of uh, S-400s from uh, Russia, something that is against the NATO policy, and uh, a NATO member did that. There is a provision for sanctions under a U.S. law uh, that uh, the administration didn't proceed to these actions, sanctions. Uh, why do you think this is happening? And uh, why the president is willing to lose probably some of the Greek-American votes uh, with this uh, policy, not to blame Turkey openly? And uh, 
take some action against Turkey because the situation here is dangerous. Day by day, Turkey pro uh, proceeds with dangerous actions in the Aegean, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think we all understand that the Turkey-U.S. relationship is pretty compl complicated. Um, and I just want to admit, not... I want to highlight a few facts. Number one, it was the Trump administration that put sanctions on Turkey for human rights violations in the case of Pastor Brunson. It was the Trump administration that removed Turkey from the F-35 program. And, you know, I think Turkey also took advantage of the COVID crisis um, in some of the provocations that they pursued in the Mediterranean. I think people understand, you know, I'm not a fan of Erdogan. I think he's a huge troublemaker. I think the president knows that. And I think um, you saw that when the State Department, and I, I just pulled it before the, this, this forum because I wanted to make sure everyone understands what the State Department issued to Turkey when just recently, um, this was actually a few weeks ago, actually October 13th, the State Department said, the United States deplores, deplores Turkey's October 11th announcement of renewed Turkish survey activity in areas over which Greece asserts jurisdiction in the Eastern Mediterranean. State Department uh, spokesman said, coercion, threats, intimidation, military activity will not resolve tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean we urge Turkey to end this calculated provocation and immediately begin exploratory talks with Greece. I happen to be pretty close with Secretary Pompeo. Um, I know that he loves your new prime minister. I know that Prime Minister Mitsotakis totally impressed everybody in the Trump administration, including the president. And recently, I, I think you know, Secretary Pompeo spent time with Prime Minister Mitsotakis in Crete. His wife is Orthodox. We always talk about Greece together and he has nothing but wonderful things to say about Greece. And he's not impressed either with what kind of shenanigans Turkey is pulling uh, in, in the Mediterranean. So I think you have, I, I think you all misread this a little bit because there's not you know, instantaneous condemnation of everything, you know, happening with Turkey. I would prefer to be harder myself. Um, I'm interested though, you know, I have an affinity, obviously far more for Greece and I have a, a soft spot for Greece and I care about Greece and I don't want to see them um, victims of provocation of Turkey. And I care about the church and I care about what Turkey is doing in Constantinople and they should be punished for what they've done to the church. And so look, we all have different degrees of how we handle these, these issues. Uh, I for one, am always willing to stand up for Greece. And I think you have a, a president and a state department uh, that has, and they're not fans of this guy Erdogan in spite of what you read. So the last thing I wanna say is because I, I know I'm gonna listen in, to Alexi, uh, his answer too. Um, but since I have to leave we, we're, uh, it, it, before the next question, I know you all going to talk some more. I wanted to thank the Delphi Forum. I wanted to thank Alexi, Simeon. Uh, I've got a couple great cousins, Ari and Aris, that are watching in Greece. Uh, I, I care about this stuff a lot. And it's not just politics, it's who we are as people. And I, I, I do want to see Greece prosper. I'm totally impressed with the Prime Minister, Athenis, and the rest of his crew and what they're doing there. So God bless you all. And I look forward to Alexi's answer as well. Take care. Alexi, thank, uh, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Alexi, uh, you listen to what the chairman said about the greek Turkish issues, the attitude of Turkey, the... the, the, the a policy of the administration. I want to be specific. Uh, I follow these issues for almost 25 years. 
I listen statements, I listen uh, speeches, uh, I see visits uh, back in Washington and here from uh, administration officials. Can you say to us why Joe Biden will be different and if a Joe Biden administration will have some specific action against Turkey and uh, sanctions, something uh, concrete aside from talk, statements, speeches, and nice visits? Uh, well, with all due respect uh, to the chairman, I would, I would go one step further and say that Erdogan is not only a troublemaker, but he is a murderous dictator who makes the world, makes the region a more dangerous place. Um, and before I answer your question on Turkey, let me just say that when it comes to foreign policy, and this is important because the way that other countries look at us uh, will continue to be uh, immensely important as we continue to live in a global world. We will definitely, under Joe Biden, see a recommitment to international cooperation on the part of America. Sadly, America first, uh, under Donald Trump, has become America alone. And that breaks my heart as someone whose parents were uh, born and raised in Greece. And um, I think it's important to note that Joe Biden will reverse that. America's commitment to NATO will no longer be called into question. The EU will be treated as a valued partner rather than a rival. And global issues, important, vitally important global issues like climate change, will be tackled via global coalitions. America will not be absent diplomatically and leave countries like Russia and Turkey to decide what happens in the Caucasus and Libya and Syria. So it's important to keep, uh, to be clear, and there's a limit to what the U.S. can do. The Biden administration is going to have to tackle unprecedented domesticated needs due, sadly, in large part to putting the pieces of this nation back together. But America will once again be stable, a stable and reliable partner and a beacon of hope uh, for the rest of the world to look at. Um, and I will say this as far as Greece, someone who's known Joe Biden uh, for over a decade and someone who's in the room um, in the White House when Greece was dealing with the, the enormous economic challenges uh, that they were facing a while back. And Joe Biden, got together with Greek Americans and did everything he could to make sure that Greece wouldn't leave the euro and to provide whatever uh, help we could to Greece. With the Biden administration, for the first time in decades, you would have an incoming president who knows Hellenic issues in great detail. And that familiarity and track record will also be a feature of members of his team that are known uh, to the Greek community, to the Greek government, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Mark Car Mike Carpenter, just to name a few. Joe Biden's team have relationships and a very strong working rapport with Prime Minister Mitsotaki, President Anastasiadis, former Prime Minister Tsipras, and uh, a very close relationship with ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. So let me just say this, Joe Biden. Do you expect sanctions, uh, specific concrete actions from a Biden administration against Turkey? That's, that's the big I, question. I can't answer, uh, I can't answer that, uh, but I will tell you, uh, I, my guess is yes, they understand. Uh, they understand the challenges that, that, that Turkey is presenting. They understand the implications for the region. And I think um, Joe Biden's leadership, his experience on foreign policy, his attention to detail, his knowledge of the situation versus someone who is, knows nothing and I would even make the argument that is maybe semi-literate and doesn't even read uh, books or has any idea probably where Greece or Crete or Cyprus are, uh, is going to be important. And so let me say this, uh, Dimitri, Joe Biden is closer to the Greek American community than any other incoming president during our lifetime. And his general foreign policy vision uh, will be emphasizing international cooperation, human rights, alliances, is something that would work tremendously to the benefit of Greece and Cyprus. And I will also note that only the Biden campaign, not the Trump campaign, has presented an official statement of where it stands on our issues, on Hellenic issues. Erdogan is, is clearly worried and scared about the prospect of a President Biden, and especially if teamed up with the Chairman Bob Menendez of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, someone who's been a stalwart ally of Greece and Cyprus, and is a hero to those Greek Americans uh, who live in the United States. Um, that is why we see Erdogan acting up in the Eastern Mediterranean before that happens. He's trying to cause trouble. 
So in closing, I know that uh, Ryan's had to leave. I just wanted to say thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you to the Delphi Forum. Είναι μεγάλη τιμή για μένα να είμαι εδώ, να είμαι εδώ μαζί σας. Ευχαριστώ για όλα που κάνετε και ελπίζω να πάνε όλα καλά τρί, στη τρίτη και ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την ευκαιρία. Εμείς ευχαριστούμε. Ευχαριστούμε, Αλέξη. Uh, uh, Dimitri and I will continue the conversation. Uh, I think picking up on, on uh, uh, your best point about the sanctions, right? Uh, and one of the changes in American foreign policy, something that's probably a lot different than you were, since you were last in Washington, Dimitri, is how much more aggressive and assertive Congress has become. Uh, on a bipartisan basis, by the way, because this sanctions law that you talked about yes. is not a, not only a Democrat, it's a Republican thing. Uh, we've seen as President Trump has refused or re resisted the putting on Katza, it's not only Bob Menendez who is screaming about it, it's Jim Risch, it's Jake Reed yeah, it's, and... Yeah, and I will and I will say this: sanctions may be a foregone conclusion, no matter who wins. Uh, there is right now an amendment in the National Defense Authorization Act, a bipartisan amendment, and the leader of it is actually a Republican, Adam Kinzinger, who, interestingly enough, served in the Air Force at Incirlik. Uh, and if, if that amendment passes, and to remind our our uh, watchers and our, our participants, the National Defense Authorization Act is one of two must-pass pieces of legislation because otherwise the Pentagon and the, the Defense Department are not funded. But we, when that passes, it, which will it will pass and probably be signed into law in December, the next president uh, will have 30 days after that to present sanctions to Congress. So Congress we, seems we, to have... Yes. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but we saw that yeah. in the past. I, uh, you are right when you say that uh, Congress became uh, becomes more aggressive uh, on this issue. Uh, but uh, we all know that uh, uh, the president, the administration, specifically the president, has uh, almost absolute power on foreign policy. Uh, yeah, the other thing, no, Dimitri, I think that would change. That's what's changed. You got to remember in the, some of the legislation that's passed, for example, the Magnitsky Act, right? It yes. used to be Congress would authorize the president, but then the president had absolute discretion in imposing. Now, the, this, this amendment, this amendment, mm -hmm. just to be clear, this amendment removes the discretion for the president. It's not the president can impose sanctions. The president must impose yeah. sanctions. So All right. Under Maybe, maybe if this amendment passes, maybe whether it's President Biden or President Trump, they'll decide, just like if we remember in, in the Magnitsky Act, in the Passer Brunson Act uh, case, President Trump imposed sanctions, but on very low level officials, right? We, something that we're even frustrated about the European Union doing. But we saw that when the United States imposes on anybody in Turkey, it has an effect. Yes, you're right on that. but. Uh, coming back to uh, our two guests on the discussion, yeah. uh, I think you agree that uh, when the chairman, uh, Mr. Pribus, mentioned the last state, the last few statements from the State Department, they are very important. And uh, in my opinion, it is very important that uh, for the first time in many, many years, personally, a Secretary of State is fully engaged on these issues on Greek-Turkish relations, on what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, and at the same time, what is happening with Cyprus. Uh, the answer that, because you saw that I was very, uh, I was pushing hard Alexei to tell me a specific thing. Uh, in my opinion, with all due respect to Alexei, uh, he's a good friend and a great Greek-American that feels passionately about Greece, he escaped a specific answer on that said, I can't answer that. He mentioned a lot of people on the Biden team, like Tony Blinken, a friend of mine. Uh, another friend of mine, uh, Nick Burns, is very close to uh, Vice President Biden. He will have a role probably in the administration if Biden, Biden is elected. 
But at the same time, I remember these people when they, when they had positions, very important positions, in the Clinton administration. Uh, and even at that time, when the time, uh, when the specific moment came to act against Turkey, they didn't. And uh, I'm fearing that now we are in the middle of an election, a very close election, a very tough election for, bo for both candidates. Uh, but when it comes to actions after the elections, I'm feeling that we will see again the same movie. Uh, a lot of talk, a lot of pushing, but no actions. That's my fear. I hope I will be proved wrong. Well, but... we, we, should all, we should always, that's right. Yeah, and frankly, we should always be informed by the past, right? That should be the fear. Uh, it is, as you know, because when you were in D.C., uh, Turkey was still a golden child. It's not, right? We already see the Turkish government threatening Joe Biden. It's still, it's we all it still picks up economically. And that's important. Excuse me? We don't, it's, a, it's still a big economy, a big market, an important, an, an, an important country. Well, we we it's, not really that. An, it's not an important market for the United States. Let's, uh, let's kind of be clear about that. Maybe for yeah. Europe, yes. Uh, but I also, like I said, you know, when, when we, it used to be just a few people in Congress and it used to be mostly partisan, the view on Turkey. Now it's bipartisan. Um, I do like you celebrate. And I think Mike Pompeo has done a, a, an exceptional job on the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, but Mike Pompeo is going to be on the ballot in 2024, not on, tw not in 2020. Right. And, and one of, one of the problems is. Uh, as we see it, you know, you see the reports that Trump is ready to fire the deputy, the minister, the secretary of defense, the CIA director, the FBI director. Uh, these we we just had Chairman Priebus, who was chief of staff. We had Secretary Mattis uh, until the president himself and until the White House itself echoes what Secretary Pompeo is saying and doing. Uh, and and what Congress is doing, because a lot of the activities at the State Department, I celebrate. Absolutely. We're, we should be very happy that we had a partial lifting of the arms embargo. We should be very happy that we have the expansion in Suda Bay. We should be very happy about Cyprus entering the IMED uh, program. And But we should also recognize that all of those initiatives, all of those initiatives started with Congress. They did not start with the administration. So the fact is, is that we need Congress to be pushing more, no matter who is in the White House. Uh, I think as, uh, you know, I will be looking at, again, North Carolina and Arizona uh, because maybe the biggest consequence uh, for Greece would be a chairman, Bob Menendez, right? Because in the next few years, let's some things that we didn't get to, you know, there's going to be a new ambassador in Greece, right? And uh, maybe in Greece, some people are taking it for granted how, how much Jeffrey Pyatt uh, pushed. We have gone more than two years without a confirmed assistant secretary of state for Europe. And this is not as this is not to cast aspersions uh, about Mr. Reeker, Ambassador Reeker, but the fact is, there's no question that he's less effective uh, because people know he's just acting. So you know, That's we need a lot of things. The fault of Congress also. Excuse me. That, uh, it's not the fault of the administration only that we don't have a confirmed assistant secretary for Europe, because it happens all over positions that they, there, are, there are a lot of delays and resistance in the House, in for this, example. Yeah, but in, in this particular case, Dimitri, it wasn't a delay. Uh, they they appointed him as acting. They did not submit him to Congress for full confirmation. Yeah, and that was, kind of, that was kind of a blow, especially coming after, because like you said about Pompeo, which act, what, the, there was some great promise in this first four years. I, I, I could argue that Wes Mitchell was shaping up to be the most promising assistant secretary of state in Europe, at least on Holbrook level. And he left and we've only had acting since. Uh, so it, it makes you wonder, you know, how far are we prioritized uh, in this region? Uh, and, you know, again, there is a lot of response. I would I would argue that uh, Secretary Pompeo's 
activity was motivated by two factors. One, the legislation, the East Med Act, because he was enforcing it. And, and two, uh, the Abraham Accords, right? Because if you think about the countries that are in the Abraham Accords, they're all lining up with Greece right now. And this is something that Greece itself should prioritize its regional partnerships, its regional uh, alliances, and they should be turned into alliances. Uh, the closer Greece is with UAE, the closer it is with Israel, the closer it is with Bahrain, uh, the better for Greece in Washington, right. D.C. as well. You're right on that. We have to move quickly with Israel on our strategic relationship. We have to move quickly and very strongly with the uh, Arab states that they are getting back on the easy side, I can say, with Israel. That's very important. But um, in any case, I see that we are at 7 o'clock Greek time. Uh, and I think that was a very important discussion. Unfortunately, we have a very short time to discuss all these important issues. We missed a lot of uh, important issues. Uh, Alexi uh, touched uh, briefly on the uh, foreign policy in general. I had to say and ask some uh, things, uh, some specific questions on that. But um, in any case, it was a very uh, interesting, informative and uh, important discussion. Thank you, Dimitri, and thank you for everybody who participated and to the Delphi Economic Forum. And uh, no matter the result on Tuesday, I think we're going to be having a lot more discussions on the consequences for Greece and the Eastern sure. Mediterranean. Of course, uh, thank uh, the, the Five Forum again uh, for this opportunity. It was uh, marvelous, and I hope uh, we will have the opportunity to discuss uh, more after the election. Sure. All right. Thank Good you. night. Good night.